because tonight, uh, it's going to be kind of brief tonight. Uh, I didn't prepare a lot, but I was really convicted on what, what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about how much of the church has traded their inheritance for the world's glory. And the key, you know, this is still, um, I'm still focusing on revival. And the key to revival is repentance and prayer. Even the church, even so much of, of, I think more in us than we even realize. That how much we look to the world's glory and we, we seek after the world's glory instead of the glory of God. And, and so I want to talk about that a minute. I want, let's look at... Uh, First of all, I want to look at how Satan tempted Jesus. Because how he tempted Jesus is how he tempts us. And he uses the same temptations that he did on Jesus to get us to sell or trade our inheritance for the world's glory. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. I'm going to jump a little bit instead of reading all, all this. But I'm going to start with Matthew 3 verses 16 through 17. And then go on to chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, skip to 5 and 6, and then skip to 8 and 9. I'm trying just to get to the point, you know, and, and kind of skip. So first of all, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. It says, when he, talking about Jesus, had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he, talking about John, saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now let's look at the first temptation. So he was led into the wilderness. He was baptized, filled with the Spirit, led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. First temptation, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Can you imagine? 40 days, 40 nights. He's hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Second temptation, verse 5 and 6. It didn't work with Jesus. <laughs> the first one didn't work. So he goes to the second temptation, verse 5 and 6. Then the devil took him up into the holy city. He set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. Again, it didn't work. And you, know, we can see, you can read on and see that he used the word of God to fight the temptation. Then verse 3. I mean, the third temptation. Verse 8 and 9. And then again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the, of the world and their glory. Catch that. And their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Again, Satan uses the very same temptations on us. Christians. John warned us in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the fathers, is not of the father, but it is of the world. So first Satan uh, tempted Jesus using his hunger. He was hungry. The lust of the flesh. He tried, you know, he thought, man, you know, this guy's gone 40 days and 40 nights. He's hungry. Let me see if I can get him to do, to make, turn these stones into bread. When that didn't work, 
Satan challenged him to prove who he was. I believe that's the pride of life. To prove that he's the son of God. And then Satan's final temptation was to show him the lust of the eyes, all the kingdoms of the world, and their glory, and offer it all to him if he would only fall down and worship him. One of these temptations, if not each and every one of, uh, of them, would mo most likely work on us. But it didn't work on Jesus because he was not a fallen man. He was sinless, full of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, and wisdom. Jesus saw that in the world's glory, what most of us would not see. He looked at the world's glory, and most of us would get all fired up and excited. Think, man, I want that. Jesus saw what we couldn't see. Instead of beauty, he saw ashes. He saw death and the penalty of sin that had to be paid for the sacrifice by a sacrifice of a sinless man. Instead of all the worldly promises of joy and peace and happiness, Jesus saw that they were all lies from the enemy. Instead of all the worldly enticement, Jesus saw corruption and he saw decay. He understood that the world's glory was nothing but bait to catch foolish victims. See, we are so enticed by the things of the world, and many times I don't think we even realize how, how enticed we are and how willing we are to be disobedient to God in order to obtain some of that world's glory. Our Savior rejected, and he refused to pay the cost of disobedience to God in order to get this world system. He refused. However, the glory which our Lord rejected is being sought after by not just the worldly people, but much of the church as well today. The church is doing the same thing many times, trying to bring in the things of the world in order to draw people, trying to satisfy the Christians by all the things of the world. Many within the body of Christ are admitting that there's something to be said for the favor of worldly glory. Many insist that Christians should not cut themselves off from the pleasures of the world, except from at least, you know, except from those things that are so morally bad that they can, they can kind of embrace that. But you know, that line is fastly going away. You know, what used to seem a few years ago so bad that no Christian would, would even dare think about you know saying it was okay for the church now is embraced in the church it's many things instead of standing on the word of God many Christians are using the values of society that Jesus rejected to re to attract people to the gospel you know it's like we're we're trying to be the Hollywood thing you know for the church trying to use all the worldly techniques in order to draw we, the church, are in desperate need of repentance. We pray for revival with no awareness that we too have been seduced by the glory of the world. We've been seduced into falling down and worshiping the ruler of this world. That's pretty heavy right there. I don't think we realize. I know we don't. I know we don't. But we've been, we've been seduced into this. It's such a subtle thing that we've turned to the, to the world and the world systems for our answers, for our hope, for our, for our uh, peace, for our uh, provision, for all that, for our health, for everything. We're now living in a time where it's uh, possible to see how the Antichrist will be embraced by the world. See, the world, this worldly distractions and noise is all around us. There's so much distractions and so much worldly influence and worldly noise that we seem to not even have time to even think about the things of God. We, I just wrote down, we're looking at today school shootings, pastors being, their homes being shot into today, economies collapsing around the world. Wars and rumors of wars. Flooding like I've never seen in my lifetime all across the world. 
amazing flooding, earthquakes like we've never seen. Death and destruction bombard the media. The striving amongst ourselves and the workforce and even the church many times to get ahead. Competition, jealousy, envy, and strife. And all this is such a loud, worldly noise with confusion that it's hard to even get your mind out of that stuff and, and into the things of God to even spend some time meditating on who God is and reminding ourselves that who's really in control. It's like we're so overwhelmed and freaked out with what's happening we don't even take the time to, to look to Jesus. Paul told us in 2 Timothy verse 3 1 through 5. You might want to turn there, and I know you know this scripture, but you can turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5. That in the last days, perilous times will come. We're living in the last days. And you can take a look at this list and realize we are. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and then he goes on to say, from such people turn away. But this is the world that we're living in right now. We're in it right now. Instead of looking to the Prince of Peace, we look to the world. Instead of walking in faith, we walk in fear. Instead of setting our minds on things above, we set our th mind on things of the world, on the, of the earth. Philippians 4.8 says that whatsoever things are true, are, I can't read my writing, honest, are just, are pure, are lovely, are of a good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. We need to make sure we're keeping our minds on the things of God, you know, that we, we, we turn off the stuff and all the noise that's coming at us and trying to attack our minds and take over our thoughts. So what are we to do as Christians? I believe the answer for us tonight, I believe it's something that we can apply. is found in Psalms 46.10. And it says, be still and know that I am God. That's a powerful thing. Be still. That word be still means to let go. Drop your hands. Do nothing. You know, stop warring. Stop fighting. Stop pushing. Stop doing it in your own power. And know that I am Lord, that I am God. See, if we'll get a hold of that tonight, I believe that's something that we can, we can use and apply tonight. It's beginning tonight in our life. That we just need to stop, be still, and know that he is God. You know, an interesting point in that scripture, when it says to be still and know that I am God, is that it's found in the midst of noise and commotion. In verse 2 and 3 of, of Psalms uh, 46 there, it says that even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains are carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. He's talking about when everything is falling in, when everything's breaking down, when everything, all hell is broke loose, be still and know that I am God. The Bible says that there's this voice that can be heard out of the silence, out of just being calm, over quit trying to handle it, over quit trying to do it in your own power, over trying to fight this thing, trying to you know, overcome it and figure out how to do it, and just be still and know. That God is God. He is our refuge, it tells us in this scripture. He is our strength. And he is a very present help in trouble. He goes on to say, then, who are we going to fear? 
There's nothing to fear. If he is our refuge, if he is our strength, if he is our God. This scripture reminds me of 1 Kings 19, verses 11 and 12. It's where Elijah had to turn from all the noise himself and let go and be still and, and in order to know and hear the voice of God. I'm going to read this scripture again. It's 1 Kings 19, 11 and 12. This has always been one of my, I love this scripture. Then he said, this is the Lord speaking to Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. See, we get so caught up, don't we, just in the noise. And all the commotion and all the things that are happening. And the wars and this and that and the other. The earthquakes and the floods and... And we get focused on those things, and that's not the Lord. The Lord is speaking to his people in that still, small vo voice. We tend, uh, even as Christ Christians, to look to the world to rescue us. Our first thought when something happens is, is, okay, what can I do and who can I turn to? <laughs> what can I get? What can, how can I handle this? We turn to the world to help us, for our help, for our counsel, for our joy, for our peace, instead of turning to God when things are falling apart in our life. The first place we ought to always go, but even before it falls apart, is to God. That's the thing we got to learn. We got to teach ourselves and remind ourselves that we got to go to God. We got to stay with God. We got to continue to walk with God and not run to the world for our help. If we truly want revival, church, we need to repent for making the world our God. I really believe that. I, I'm afraid that and so many of us, including myself, uh, continually, without even realizing it, making the world our God. He's a jealous God. You know, as long as we're looking to, to the world for our answers, He'll let you try to find them there. But we need to learn quickly and turn to the Lord and seek Him. We need to listen to that still, small voice. Get His counsel. Get His direction. Get His plan. We need to put down our own efforts, our own strength. And we need to be still in the presence of God. We need to meditate on the promises of God. We need to look to Him and allow Him to be our God. And allow Him to be our refuge and our strength. You know, we're definitely living in end times, and the Bible clearly tells us what some of these end times look like. And you can obviously see it even now as we speak. But God is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our peace. He's our safety. He is our uh, deliverer. He's the one that will walk with us and never leave us and never abandon us. But as long as we're looking to the world and its system, the enemy will abandon you. Yeah, he uses the world to, uh, to, to allure us into thinking that we can find it in him quicker and easier. And I think for us as a church that's seeking revival, we just need to be reminded and we need to repent before the Lord. Like, let the Lord, let the Holy Spirit begin to point out places in our life that we've not truly turned to the Lord on, that we've not surrendered, that we continue to look other places. He wants to be our God, not the world and its systems. That being our God is our provider and our protector. That's what that means. He wants to take care of us. And he don't want us looking to the world to take care of us.